The trio of Vane, Aiden, and Reeds over the past year has taken the ALGS world by storm in various ways. First, it was their legendary strength on contests. They're landing for it. Lomi, Lomi! I'll drop him. I have one bullet! I have one bullet! I'm not- He's one! I have no ammo! Then, it was their immense fighting power finally leveraging into results in North America. Glitch Energy now making their run towards this endgame. Two squads remaining, they're gonna clean up the final pieces that are left. But Glitch Energy, once again, I don't think enough good things can be said about them. 70 points, finishing in first for the series. And now they have climbed to the heights, nearing greatness with a third place finish at the split two playoffs land. As TSM go down to Oxygen, surely NRG can win this from a fan Fantastic oh, position. No they have played all game. Aiden out here with the females and Nathan. The moment they close in the gap, Oxygen Esports say put it in the bag. Hold that circle. We'll hold the KP and we'll hold game four on store point. Welcome back to the reset where today we will be discussing the rise of the BR Demons, now known as Oxygen Esports, and how in their first ever LAN they managed to place top three. The story of Oxygen actually starts all the way back in 2021 when Van played on the team known as Bottom 20. For those that remember, this is the squad that ends up winning the 2021 North American ALGS Championship. I can only 100. I got you, I got you. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go and goes on to be signed by 100 Thieves. But this team of Vayne, Scurry, and Anmu eventually part ways mutually, as after a poor run following champs, they all realized that a roster change was most likely inevitable, and Vayne stepped away from the team. I think that we had just reached a plateau in our chemistry and like where the roles were with the team. And it was really hard for us to like improve from that point. We decided to give it like a week of 110% effort and like see what would come of that. We played like attorney that weekend after that week of scrims and pretty much nothing had really changed. I felt like I wasn't improving anymore and I felt like my team wasn't improving anymore. So, you know, sometimes that just happens and, you know, the best thing for everyone is to move on. I had like brought it up maybe, maybe a couple weeks before we came to any conclusions you know if we don't start you know picking up the pace again you know we might have to make changes so we were all kind of like aware that we might need to make changes but yeah it was all it was all mutual like no one wanted to really make any changes i mean we would love to keep teaming but you know things just happen you lose kim with people i mean we've been playing for so long and i mean you need change to you know to push forward sometimes so he moves around to multiple other squads, but eventually decides to team up with Aiden and Reeds to form the BR Demons. Yeah, so Aiden and Reeds pretty much just played arenas together forever, and they were really good at it. You know, those UMG arena tournaments that were like kind of popping when arenas came out, like they had got podiums in all of them and won one or two. So they were pretty much just arena gods. And then they decided to play BR. I don't know the timing of the events, but yeah, Reeds just hit me up on Twitter because they, they were looking for a new teammate. He literally just DM'd me on Twitter. I was like, yo, want to try out? I was like, sure. And then we played like a scrim or two and I messaged him back. I was like, so are we teaming? He was like, yeah. And then we just played Pro League Quals together. And that was it, dude. <laughs> It's so weird. It was just like, we didn't even really talk to each other about anything. Like, there wasn't any like, okay, you know, like, there wasn't any like feedback loop or anything. It was just like, all right, let's just, let's just run it up, I guess. This squad was interesting to say the least. Aiden has had some pro league experience before, but it was limited and there wasn't much success. Meanwhile, Reeds has only really been playing in challengers since the early part of 2022. They played in the preseason qualifiers and managed to qualify for Pro League based on their total points. Going into Pro League, most teams in this situation would settle for lesser POIs or try to flex drop based on the lobby, but BR Demons never really considered this. In the qualifiers, they landed at Barometer and Lava Siphon and had been dealing with plenty of contests and they won all of them, so why not contest for those POIs going into Pro League? 
Of course though, these POIs were owned by G2 and TSM, two of the top fighting teams in the region. So this was an incredibly bold strategy for your first ever split of Pro League. I think we just claimed those POIs because that's where we landed in the calls and we hadn't really lost any contests. So we just kept landing there. TSM had just recently secured Lava Siphon by taking it from Sentinels and Dark Zero, but then came the BR Demons who presented TSM with a challenge unlike any they have ever faced before or after. Nice, nice! We can, we can we're we're fucking chase! Game, bro. Yeah, yeah! Thirst them! He's in the corner, west side corner, you can thirst it! You got him up, you got him up! I'm going left window, I'm going left window. I'm getting above them, bro, get above them! They're fucking dead! Uh -oh. They're about to queue up! Okay, it's pretty good. No. <laughs> Wait, how Sears do they? One. Sears one shot. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty. What good. are you fucking? <laughs> what? I told you I had no ammo. Bro, we shouldn't have chased. Oh, that. I'm going to watch the Palvod. No spoilers. Bro, are you... No spoilers. All I gotta say. Walk it off. It's pretty good. Walk it off, champ. We shouldn't have crossed to begin with. What do you mean? Yeah, we, we won the contest over the billion, but we shouldn't be- so, so, don't, We don't win the contest they unless they're dead. They're not- they don't win the contest unless they're fucking dead. TSM historically has wiped the floor with a majority of their contests. They may start off close, but at some point, TSM pulls away and forces the opposing team out. But TSM and the BR Demons contest was nearly 50-50. They were locked in a situation where neither team could gain the upper hand. It was clear that we were seeing a clash of the Titans. Despite being so new, the BR Demons had instantly established themselves as a force off contest. But as Pro League approached, both teams realized that a contest was not going to go over well. Fighting every single World's Edge game off drop and only winning half would make it difficult for either squad to make a run at qualifying for LAN, so a compromise was reached. The TSM contest going into Pro League um, obviously was, it was really close, um, but it was just kind of a waste of time for us because, I mean, we're so new, like we need to work on playing the game. As a, even if we win Siphon, like we weren't like that great. Uh, at really much besides team fighting as much as i understand that's like a waste of time and d so does tsm like aiden breeds aren't really they don't really know that too much like they're just down to just land there forever until like it does like it literally doesn't matter but yeah it was mostly uh raven's idea to and i give us some info and then we would just leave he gave us contest contest strats for um another POI. So we started going survey Epe. And so we win the contest there against Sentinels. During their time at survey and Epicenter, a legendary mantra was born. Don't child the BR the demons. So, got a character, became Aiden the destroyee. Bro, that is so bad. He actually hit that, don't child the BR demons. <laughs> Since then, this statement has become legendary, a defining moment for this team, but it only ever reached that status because of their handful of contests that followed. At this point, the BR Demons showed to be even with TSM, and they had just beaten Sentinels, but on Storm Point, they were contesting G2 for Barometer. They're already up. They're they're up. Horizon's one, Horizon's one. That's one. I'm coming. I'm coming up. Better. Oh my god, BR Demons. That's a fast, fast push for BR Demons, man. I mean, I can't believe that. That is incredible. They land, get a gun, and immediately take the zip line. I am like incredibly impressed with the way that with the way that BR Demons is playing this contest, dude. They have been an absolute menace right now. Yeah, I don't think so. That's not like yeah, it's not. I mean, they need to fucking do something here, man. They need to at least survive, bro. At least survive. I think we queue up instead. I think we wait for Vayne, and then we do it. I am, man. I really like the confidence that Reeds and them have, bro, in themselves. It's very, very impressive, dude. It's on the right. Yeah, I think we just go. Yeah, I'm queuing up. Oh, I thought you meant... One's on the left. 45 perp on the left. Are you guys up? Yeah, yeah. I'm zipping up from this side, okay? From I'm just gonna side. put someone on scan. Hold on, scan. 
45 on bank. Nice, reach of the good zip up. Really, so. Nice job, here we go, the 3v3 comes out! Ash going down! Two dead, last one up! Don't let him get out, do not let him get out. Grab a swap. Still under, so Rizzy. I'm gonna drop. Rizzy, Vin. Okay, I'm dropping to. Uh oh, Jay, man. Right here. He's low. Don't let him get out. Ape him down. Oh, he's not getting out. Oh my god, BR Demons wants blood right now, bro. Oh, They finished that one quickly as well. The BR Demons were making somewhat light work of what was considered at the time some of the top fighting teams in North America. Don't chow the BR Demons. Back to World's Edge, BRD was having issues at Survey and Epicenter. They felt as though Cloud9, who landed at Climatizer next to them, was griefing their early games. They always wanted to be the ones that control the fight. So rather than waiting for Cloud9 to potentially come and mess up their game plan, they took the fight straight to C9 and decided to contest for climatizer. C9 is dead, I think. I gotta swap. I'm going in for, I'm going in his bottom. Ox one. Ox one. I'm popping cells. I'm gonna kill this guy. Nice. Why is it ran over here? I'm white. Eric thinks it's your one. 15 gray. QX arms thanks to the love months. Just go across and kill this guy. Yeah, yeah, he's running. He's cracked. 50 flush. I'm running out. <laughs> Wait, I'm killing this guy. He's beaming. Exactly. He's dead, boy. No, you're not dead. You have, you have a peek. Oh my god, you dumbass. Take that wingman from the and in typical fashion, they cleaned that one up pretty quickly as well, leading to the BR Demons now landing at Climatizer, while C9 and Sentinels split Survey and Epicenter. The mantra has become legendary, don't chow the BR Demons. Over the course of a few months, they have now taken out Sentinels, G2, Cloud9, and even showed to be evenly matched with TSM. It was clear they were one of the best contesting teams in the world. The only thing that's like extremely decisive about our fights is just how little entry we need to just commit on people. And that's a big thing with contests too. Like you can't just stall a contest. Like the more time you give the other team, the more time that they have to make a play and to like group up and swing something together. You, you want the other team to have zero time to make any plans. You want them to be constantly reacting to what you're doing rather than them being able to make the play and you have to react. Because I, I think in this game, if you're fighting and reacting, you're already at a disadvantage. But in Pro League, they only managed to finish in 16th place. They could win a straight up 3v3 fight against the best in the world, but their macro was poor. They didn't have good rotations. They weren't moving into spots that would set them up to reach endgame. But if they did get one of those spots, it was rare that they would capitalize on it properly, leading to them only winning one single game in the whole split. Reeds and Aiden had been co-IGLing the split as a whole, but it was clear, at least for Reeds, that he personally wasn't enjoying the role. They needed a coach to help them fix the macro, and they needed an IGL to execute it. On top of that, they also needed an org to make this pro dream sustainable. Considering that they were unsigned, many teams were trying to poach Aiden, including Sentinels. There was even a point that Reeds and Vayne thought Aiden was gone, and were looking to trial thirds, but then in steps Glitch Gaming. Glitch is a supplement company that decided they wanted to pick up an Apex team to sponsor. With very little knowledge of Apex and its competitive scene though, they turned to someone who they felt could set them up for success, one of the OGs of Apex YouTube, Thornton Smash. Uh, so I've been really into Apex Legends for a long time and then of course I went to the Raleigh uh, Champs uh, back in 2022. And while I was there I was talking to a lot of people, I had already been sponsored independently from Glitch as a content creator. And Glitch was seeing me and how invested I was into the comp scene uh, just for my personal time and thought that if they were going to put together a comp team, I might be someone that they would want to figurehead that or spearfront it. So Thornton starts to manage Glitch's interest in competitive Apex, but their first roster and challengers wasn't performing to their hopes, so they decided they needed to bring in a coach. Um, and during this time period was actually the first time that I had reached out to Psycho because 
for a long time I actually wanted Psycho. He wasn't a piece that was grabbed specifically for Aiden Reed's in vain. Uh, his brain is incomprehensible is the best way that I can describe it. He's one of the smartest people I've met with an emotional IQ to actually match that. So at the time, uh, Thornton Smash had came to me uh, twice. The, the first time he had asked me like, you know, do you want to work for Glitch? You know, I had a recommendation from PVP. You know, I had I had you and I had Raven. Those are the two recommendations I had. So I know that you're available in this situation and I'd love to see if you're interested. First, I told him no, uh, because the, the pay was just very different. Um, but then again, I came to that point in my head where I want to do things with, you know, less younger talent and, and kind of get my way back into pro league. And, you know, at this point, I'm still talking with other coaches and I'm still seeing kind of what the general vibe is. And, you know, there was a point where in a well-known coaches discord, actually, I won't give exactly who, but um, basically some people were calling me a, a scam coach or a fraud, somebody who actually didn't go out and, and do the work. Um, and I took pretty, you know, took that pretty hard personally. Um, but I recognize that at the same time, I can't necessarily let that get to me and I need to put in the confidence and put in more work. And I knew that being in North America could do that. Glitch had a CC team at that point, which was matching Soupy and Lamek. And those were the people that I was gonna coach. So I, I went over to Glitch and uh, they gave me kind of, again, a, a lesser offer than the school, but I understood what I wanted to do and I was willing to take, you know, that risk and that bet. So I did. So Glitch secures Psycho as the coach. The season progresses and Glitch doesn't end up making it to Pro League through LCQ and the roster splits up. This puts Thornton and Psycho in a situation where they're looking for a new team and Glitch was hoping to secure one of the teams that was going to land. Most of the land teams were already taken, but Thornton and Psycho had their eyes on the promising BR Demons. I'd say there was probably like five or six different teams that we had contacted and talked with, but the most promising from a raw standpoint was BR Demons, like no doubt. We had saw Vayne and, and Aiden and, and Reeds. And I noticed that they just didn't have macro, but they had extremely good fighting potential. And they had the veteran to kind of back it up, Vayne in that case, right? So we, we pick up that team and I noticed all the issues with it. We're really good at contesting. We're, you know, trying to work in a different type of um, meta. We give up climatizer, fight tripods. And, the whole thing. Um, then, you know, we, we start to include uh, SWL in this because I understood that there were things that I couldn't do, right? The power of what Oxygen does really well right now is it's a synergy. I understand where my weaknesses are. They understand where their weaknesses are. Jack is not a personal person, so talking strategy with the team is, is something that's very hard for him to do. Uh, versus me, I'm more personable, charismatic. I understand what the player's thinking at this time. So we go through it. But Jack is able to pull everything from, you know, ring data and creating indexes of things, being able to tell us what beacons are good and what beacons are bad, when we're gonna have crafter, when we're not. And, you know, what changes are to come to the game that we don't know of yet. So having somebody like him, it was important. So I sacrificed a, a bit of my compensation at the time actually to, to make that happen because I understood what we needed um, to succeed. And so that's what we did. So the BR demons get signed to Glitch, but at first it was just Vayne and Reeds. Aiden comes later though, as he says no to potential suitors and sticks with the team. Their work begins immediately, fix the macro. Fixing it not only shifted rotates, timings, or the spots they played for, but also how they would entirely approach the game. In my opinion, there are uh, they are up there with Optic and LG as some of the just straight up best fragging fighting teams that they can just like anytime they can win a 3v3 it's there's no other team i would take it their problem was that they just didn't have any consistency on their zone play they didn't know how to kind of work the map and the rotations or be on the same page with that together and so it seemed like a pretty easy fit taking a coach that does know how to implement those kind of strategies and implementing it with Vane, Reeds, and Aiden, and turning them into a hybrid team, which is always what ends up being the most successful teams. If you look at TSM and Dark Zero, it's it's just the way it is. Is is if you get too hard in one zone, like the old Oxygen team was a very hard zone team, and there are straight 
edge teams that also like Furia, right? But what ends up happening is the game evolves, and there's different metas that come out and different playstyles, and people catch on to one particular playstyle. When you can't adapt on the fly, you're really just shooting yourself in the team in the foot as a uh, as a comp. In the past, BR Demons were an edge team through and through. They had great fighting skills, so naturally they looted as much as possible and tried to fight on the edge. But with this new shift, they played a much more flex hybrid style where they have the ability to play in multiple different ways. But before all the macro adjustments are finalized, the team ends up deciding on Vayne shifting into the IGL role. So going into Pro League, we switched IGLs. Reeds used to be the IGL, and I noticed that Vayne wanted to take up that torch, but the concern that I had with Vayne was that he's not vocal enough. He's very soft-spoken. So you can't just tell somebody though that you're, you're too soft-spoken, you need to yell more. It, it doesn't work like that. You need to figure out how can you encourage their style of IGLing, of being a little bit quiet and prioritize things that they want to get out more in vocality, but also make it so that their quietness will go into their play. I think it even goes back to um, one of the reasons why I left 100 Thieves, but I didn't really know it at the time. Because I was unhappy with my role, and I didn't really know why. And over the course of that next year, you know, I'm moving around on teams, and Overall, I'm just trying to like find where I need to go as a player. Um, I didn't really know it would be IGLing, but as kind of time went on, it became like more and more obvious that I should IGL. And I actually have some skills that I didn't know I had um, in the leadership department because um, I've always been super quiet. But anyways, when we first started teaming, I, I was like IGLing at first, but that was my like first time ever doing it and i was pretty bad at it um i didn't really have anyone to help me either and not to knock any reads but they weren't exactly the most patient with that so they were like no we're just gonna call and i was like okay that's fine psycho could just see the talents that i had and the experience i had and like he understood the steps that i needed to take to get to like that point like he could see the path in front of me that I necessarily couldn't. And he was really good at ex explaining that to Aiden and Reeds, you know, the value that was there that I didn't really know about. Vane, and he said it before, is very proactive, Igel. This is something that I told him. I said to, to Vane, I said, you're more like a sweet. You like to be proactive and control the variables around you. You already know what's going to come to you. Don't put yourself in the middle of the fray, in the middle of the fire, and play like how you're not you're not that type of IGL. You don't vocalize like that. So create yourself some space so that way when you know you're behind the wall, you're in the smoke, whatever it may be, you're in the position that you get to control the variables of what to fight and what not to, because you need to be able to tell your team in advance that's what you want to do create proactivity in your play. With Vayne as the IGL, Psycho developing their macro, adding in someone who leaks as their analyst, and the team's incredible firepower, they decided to claim a new POI, Lava Fissure, heading into Split 2. They briefly contested for it against a few other squads, but none of those contests were notable as the other teams allowed them to have it. Once again, don't chow the BR demons. All of this new change was proving to be working too, as they start off the split in the top five after just two match days. But the strong start was short-lived as their following two match days saw them falling down all the way to 15th. And the team mentioned two specific reasons as to why this skid occurred. Yeah, our first First, um, couple, like leading up to the split, we pretty much were only focused on macro and where we're putting ourselves in the zone, like having a game plan for all the zones, uh, understanding like where we want to rotate, but we weren't really focused on like fundamentals. So like team chemistry, good comms, being coordinated and swinging stuff together, not getting picked, stuff like that. Um, we didn't really focus on that until like halfway through the split. So like our first... Our first like three match days like we'd either we'd either have like really good games or really bad games it's like our macro was was getting there it was getting solid so like if our macro game plan worked out and we got a good spot like we could just close out the game pretty well but um like 
a lot of the time too, somebody would make like a small mistake or we would misunderstand comms or there'd be too many people talking or you know, it just wasn't our team chemistry and our dynamic wasn't flowing very well. You know, we're a bit all over the place. And you could definitely see that in our thoughts too. Our comms were terrible then. A, a lot of those issues would just bleed through and cost us a lot of points. And another big thing halfway through the split is Mirage being added to the picture. Don't know why. You know, mid pro league split, just add Mirage Mirage right there. So they add that and that screws up pretty much our entirety of World's Edge macro. When it comes out of Mirage Voyage, it, it just put a pain in, in everything um, because teams are taking it and then getting ahead of us on the rotation and then we're getting kind of clipped on that. And But we want to be somewhere and we got to be there fast. So, you know, the rotation was a problem. So that's where you have to just put your thinking cap on. I said, Vane, here's some of the solutions for this. You know, we can use a balloon here. We can, you know, rotate this way around and you can come back through the middle and get to where you want to go. This is the solutions to this problem because inting Mirage right now is just going to kind of slow us down. Then we're going to have to play Edge and, you know, we got NRG next to us that might just try to kill us if the ring isn't there. There's just so many issues to that Mirage just caused with the macro. Mirage Voyage was becoming an issue. When Glitch had originally claimed Lava Fissure, Mirage Voyage was not on the map, but Respawn added it in and some of the other lower tier teams started to claim it as their drop spot. At this point in time, most teams have realized that Mirage is not good enough as a solo POI. You get no ring console, no crafter, and your rotates are heavily dependent on the teams around you. And that last point about rotates specifically affects Lava Fissure when a team is present at Mirage. Staging and Landslide can just rotate away from the POI early to avoid it affecting their game, and Thermal Station would only ever have to deal with them on Northern Pulls, but they should be long gone by the time that the Thermal team is done looting. Lava Fissure though, when rotating south, struggles. Both staging and Mirage teams clog up any potential rotates south, and they are forced to wait on these teams to pass by, otherwise they're at risk of an early fight and potential third parties. And this negatively affects the initial macro they had formed prior to Mirage being added. They managed somewhat effectively at first, but as time went on, things deteriorated, and in the middle of the split, things started to shift even more. Glitch at the time, um, when we were competing in Pro League, even though we had a very strong start and sort of a, a middle beginning, I mean, a, mid, a middle mid, they simply wanted to go a different direction. So before Pro League was even over, Glitch had basically told us that, you know, we love you guys, you guys are great, but we want to go a different direction with what we're doing. We want to focus probably more on our product. And you can see that because Glitch Gaming was kind of hard for them to manage. You know, they're, they're used to being, you know, in their supplement business, not the esports business. So it, it was hard for us because now we're having our back against the wall, having to make land because if we don't make land, it's unlikely that we get an organization to sign us. A pro league roster requires a certain amount of capital to fund. And Apex Legends sometimes isn't the most cash infused esport, if you will. So it can make it hard for orgs to stay around. And what happened in my opinion with glitches, it just became really difficult to put it on just that org to continue to maintain this. And so what we did was we, I, I actually went out and um, if you haven't, I mean, most people are aware of this, Glitch sponsors the Oxygen team. So we moved some of the capital instead of Glitch just paying a huge amount of money up front, Glitch and Oxygen have a partnership now where Glitch helps fund the team well alongside still being a sponsor of it. So the players in Psycho are having to rework their macro, and Thornton behind the scenes is starting to look for more orgs to keep the team on an upward trajectory. This is a lot of potential stress, but the team responds. Their final two match days leading into the regional finals, they finish first and third, putting them at 84 points on the split, essentially making them a lock to go to land. But then as the regional finals is approaching, another curveball comes. DZ found out that land roster lock was on this Tuesday. So because the first plan was to play with Rambo for the rest of Pro League and then try out people after Pro League because they thought the roster lock for land would be later since there's like a two month break until land after Pro League. But apparently it's this Tuesday for the land, land roster lock. So now they're trying to try out other people like Aiden from Glitch to figure out like who they really, really want for land. Dark Zero has decided to start trialing new thirds, and Aiden is on the list. Yeah, he said no to everyone. 
And I think like one of the only reasons he didn't want to play with them is because they were trying to have him on Seer. <laughs> if they would have let him play like Horizon or something, he would have joined. <laughs> This is one of the multiple times that another team has tried to poach Aiden, but Vayne and Reeds have a rather unique and flexible approach to the opposing interest. But, I mean, we were all cool with that. Like, like I mean, if, if someone on our team gets picked up to DZ, you know, I mean, that's that's just a dub. Like, no one can really be mad at that. We're, in a t we're not making a lot of money. Like, we're not, like, the best team right now. We're super inconsistent. So, I don't think anyone really would have been upset. It would obviously suck to see him go, but... I'd be thrilled for him, so. But in the end, Aiden is the one who has the final say, and he decides he wants to stick with his boys. I think with us, like, especially with the staff that we had, like, we were very aware of, like, the potential that we had as a team. We were very aware that we could be extremely good, um, given how good we are at fighting, and kind of working on, like, combining that with my experience and zone and just developing ourselves in our own roles. Um, like we were just very aware that eventually we are going to be a really good team and be successful. And I mean, I'm definitely like a hard believer and so is Aiden. And I would say so is Reed's too. Like there's no doubters on the team, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Everyone's a believer, like, um, and it's definitely like benefit us a ton. Cause I mean, we're just constantly building on Kim, you know, just developing more of like the raw talent and skills into like actual results and like meaningful play style. So finally, the trio has been locked in together and they will be heading to their first ever LAN. It's time to see if the commitment to staying together despite a poor first split, behind the scenes stressors, and offers from other teams can finally pay off and result in an incredible LAN performance. Heading in though, the pressure was rising. They got signed to Oxygen Esports, bringing in a whole new wave of expectation. They then went out and won the Steel Series tournament while also performing at a very strong level in scrims. The hype had started to build. Many were saying OXG could be the Dark Horse to take the whole thing. I think we can't talk about Dark Horses without talking about probably the most popular one, Oxygen Esports. The boys Aiden, Reeds, Vayne. A lot of people are very hyped on this Oxygen Esports team. I think if there was any pick to be the most popular Dark Horse, it would be Oxygen, at least from what I've seen online. And they heard the praise, but they were focused solely on themselves and their own goals rather than the expectations of everyone else. I was personally happy with the finals appearance. I think we could uh, easily like place top 10. I, you know, firmly believe that we could just win the tournament. You know, like we've put in all this work and if you're prepared and you're practiced, like you're gonna do well. I could care less about all the outside noise, what people are saying about us, good or bad. I'm here for business. And that was made abundantly clear, as in the group stages and winner's bracket, they finished fourth in each. All the while though, TSM and Alliance were the ones receiving the praise for their dominant starts. Despite the lack of attention, OXG's beginning to the land though was very important. One of the largest changes they had made to the end of the split during scrims and now had been fully unleashed on LAN was no longer allowing for a team to land at Mirage. They enacted the mentality that Mirage was a full-fledged piece of their POI. Landing at it meant contesting. And as we all know, don't chow the BR demons. This strategy worked, and all of a sudden their macro was looking incredibly strong. Rotates were once again cleared, and they had space to work with. It also helped that they got some extra loot for their efforts. But interestingly, they were actually somewhat struggling on World's Edge. Throughout all of LAN on World's Edge, they averaged about 5.4 points per game. Meanwhile, on Stormpoint, they averaged about 10.7 points per game. Those numbers on Stormpoint, though, were strong enough to get them to fourth in the group stages and fourth in the winner's bracket. So let's take a look at two specific games from the winner's bracket to see how they managed to do so well. Through the first three games on World's Edge, they only picked up eight total points and were off to a rough start on pace to potentially fall through to the loser's bracket. But on Stormpoint, they immediately get going in game four. We start at their usual POI of barometer and the zone is pulling just north of Cascades. In these zones, they tend to rotate up through Jurassic towards the south side of Command Center so that they can come in through this east side. Problem is, in this game, they run into phase, which stalls out their rotates and they decide to get creative. 
they move up towards the top of command center with the intention of scanning the survey beacon, finding a playable spot, and then using an evac tower to go over the mountainside. While they are biding their time waiting for zone to close, Alliance from Lightning Rod starts to rotate in. Alliance is going to take the cannon up to the top of command, and Effect uses an evac tower to get to the cannon faster. Oxygen hears the evac tower and takes the time to plan out a rat play on Alliance. Yo, evac, evac, evac. He's, 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 Sure. Then Alliance takes the cannon, but somewhat staggered from each other, and then the fight breaks out. It's a little bit of a misplay from effect on this one, which leads to OXG getting a quick wipe, a heavy amount of loot delivered to them, and the knowledge that their back should now be clear. The zone closes and they hit the beacon, drop the evac, and start their flight. They notice this specific roof is open. The timing here though is key. If they played this roof earlier in the game, then there are teams with multiple angles who can shoot down on them. But with Bangalore and Catalyst, they can delay until the circle is fully closed, and then those specific angles will be cut off by Storm. To close out the game, we also see how Vayne's IGLing works on full display. As they wait on top of the roof, Vayne explains the plan of attack. Listen to me, Ed. Listen, I think, we're supposed to, I think we should wall off the right side of zone and kill this building team as they come out with nades. I see an opponent wall off here. right? Yeah, we wall off right and we want to kill this building team, I think. I agree, I agree. Okay. You're just right, here, right? So we can drop off the I can wall off the right side of zone. This is incredibly similar to Zero in our previous Dark Zero video. When given time and space, Oxygen want to dictate the game. They don't want to wait and react to others. And in these moments when they have time to breathe, Vayne will read the lobby, analyze how he expects things to play out, and then give the plan of attack for the best way for Oxygen to win. The beauty of always giving this plan far ahead of time is that Aiden and Reeds are both diligent in their ability to understand the plan as well. Wait, where do I do it? Like, where's our wall going? Notice how both Aiden and Reeds ask where to specifically place the wall. And so now that the plan is clear, wall to the cannon, drop left, throw nades so the team can't safely peek them when they drop, and then fight. But remember, both Aiden and Reeds have previous co-IGLing experience from the previous split, so they are confident making endgame calls too. Hey, play on this, play I have two in the center. Climbing, climbing. And Oxygen gets the win. When adding this to the 8 points they had from World's Edge, this puts them up to 31 total points, meaning they should be heading into the finals lobby with only a couple more points in the next two games. We are going to quickly run through game 6 as well. This one should look familiar as it's a barometer pull. OXG per usual play the height here, but I'm showing this game because this is important for how they approach the final game in the finals lobby. While sitting up on height, we hear a pretty cool comp from Vayne I want to highlight. On this, on this zone, we need to not clutter comms so we can listen to exactly what's happening below us. Right. The only comms that need to be ha uh, happened are evacs. Yeah. If you have kills, say it once. Like, might be able to look there, but we need to spread our attention and not clutter comms this zone. Yeah. We need to know what's happening below us. Cluttered comms is one of the most difficult things for a vast majority of players to avoid. In a BR, so many things happen at once, and realizing which is important in the heat of the moment can be hard, so teams will try to calm all of it. Vayne understands their positioning though, and he calls out specific rules for comms as this zone closes, once again proactively setting his team up for success. In the next zone, similar timing of around 30 to 40 seconds left till close, and we hear Reeds asking Vayne for the play. Vayne, what's that play here? I think so too. Wait, wait. I, listen, I think we're gonna land like. I think we should land here in this corner deep. I agree. I agree. And, and then, and then try and clear, clear out this edge or like walk on the roof. Wait, we can just play that roof. We can literally land here. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's full safe. Yeah. Yeah, we should do that. Where can we place it back? 
Like I've highlighted, this team is so incredibly cohesive because things are planned. Vayne is a master at preemptively picking out plays, but sometimes if he hasn't communicated the plan yet, Reeds and Aiden will also understand that there is time required to think and communicate that plan, so they're going to ask for the play while they still have time to formulate one. Also, once Vayne calls the play, his teammates always give instant feedback. This keeps them all on the same page and builds confidence in the plan. They decide to evac tower onto the roof of the far building. Now as they land here, notice their positioning in this circle. They have ultimate height. The only other height that has angles on them is here, and they can hide behind this box while utilizing Bangalore smokes to prevent this team from being a threat. Because of this, they once again have time to breathe and formulate another plan of attack. Although they are safe now, they won't be when the zone closes, so in usual OXG fashion, it's time to clear their edge. They end up grabbing third in this game, and with that, they are officially heading into the finals lobby with seven advancement points. Yeah. Grand finals, baby. So as the finals lobby begins, TSM and Dark Zero roar out to an early lead, reaching match point in only three games. At this point, Oxygen has picked up a total of 30 points. They started with seven, they grabbed nine from the two World's Edge games, and then 14 in game three on Storm Point. But like I said, TSM and DZ have reached match point. With this happening so early, was Oxygen affected at all by the threat of the lobby ending so soon? No, I mean, it's it's kind of business as usual. Like the way we start on, you know, World's Edge, like we're definitely going to at least be going to a game six and a game seven. Um, and that was our goal. Like after those first two games, like TSM and them are like super far ahead. Like we just need two star good storm point games, get on match point or close to it, you know, before game six rolls around. So we have two chances on storm point to win the tournament. Like in match point, when you're in the top five, or getting close to match point, like you should only be worth, like, especially if you know you can win the tournament and you have like a really good map, like you should be focused entirely on that. Like if we see like TSM or something or DZ, we're not gonna like, you know, int our game to kill them before we're on match point. Like we might third party, which we did in one of the World's Edge games, but pretty much entirely focused on our game. They were in a complete flow state. It didn't bother them one bit at all. The boys are locked in and we head to game four. We get a ship fall pull and OXG secures this building that should get them deep into the end game. Eventually circle is closed and Vayne as Bangalore starts taking space to see what's possible to control on the left. He gets caught out, but watch how his team responds. Boy, on me, boys, on me. Vane used Bang Smoke to buy time. Reeds then immediately puts pressure on the nearest target, and Aiden throws Catwall to split Vane with the enemy. But then Reeds gets a knock, and they flip a switch instantly to go from defense to offense. We progress a bit further in the game, they finish in second place, once again putting them all the way up to 42 total points. Only 8 points to go to reach match point. OXG knows that World's Edge is their weaker map, so the plan is to get the points and aim for a game seven closeout. And things go according to plan. Although it was a little bit rocky over the next two games, they do end up reaching the 50 point threshold, meaning we are heading to a game seven on Storm Point. At this point, they are one of five teams on match point. So it's likely this is the final game and the circle pulls barometer, which is the POI that Oxygen lands at. Aiden had called, uh, I think twice at some point. Like the, the end game is going to be a barrel zone. And I'm just leaned in at that point. I'm like, we're on match point and this is our zone. This is one of the zones that we can win. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, this could be the moment where we end up lifting that trophy and taking home money that changes all of our lives. And I'm sitting there nervous. Self. For them, though, all business. They're, they're just there. They're just like, we win this game, boys. Yeah, we're like chanting Barrow Zone before the game, summoning it. I know, my I was I was screaming in my seat. I was me and Natalie were like screaming, like we were so excited. We were praying for a barometer zone all day long. 
The macro is simple, play up top, stay alert from any potential pushes, farm armors, and then use evac towers to react to any potential zone pull. If it pulls east, we could get a similar zone to the one that OXG won in the group stages. And if it pulls west, we could see a similar one to the game where we showed earlier in winners. Later, they see the zone pull and they are prepared. It's clear from their comms. They have added an adjustment during VOD review for how they will play this zone. Pulling six, front. Eight. What the fuck is the zone? It's pulling same front. one we had yesterday. Yeah. We know yeah, how to win same this game. Way. Oh yeah. Remember what we talked about? Instead yeah. of instead of going inside that team later, it might be completely different this time. But um, <laughs> we, we watch our back for We watch our back for while they plan their next move, we get this calm from Aiden. This could, be dark, this could be Dark Zero, by the way. In my Dark Zero video, I showed how Xset was aware of their presence, but so was OXG. The difference here is that OXG is in an advantageous position. They're going for the win. Oh, they, I mean, as much as we know it's them, like, they do not matter to us at all. The only thing that matters is how we win the game. Because if we win the game, then they don't win the game. So then we hear the plan of attack for the zone. Yeah, it's the same zone. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's not. These back buildings are in. Yeah, I think we still do the same play. Enemy like, spotted. Fuck. Wait, back buildings could fuck us now. This is dead. Enemy spotted. Fuck. The seam on the roof could kill us. I think you catwall them off right when we land. Yeah, but what do we do after? What about high barrel? Is, is there anyone high? There's yeah, a team in elevator, and now there's a team in the middle, I think. Uh, <laughs> let's reposition. Never mind. Can we lock this? this can we land on roof and lock this team's door and then play behind the AC unit? Yeah. If we need to, we can yeah, just lock that's our door. Yeah, not bad. I think we still land on that roof. And then I wall our back, we live for a while. Yeah, this see team's gonna have a ton of kills. Like, they're gonna not be looking Maybe see if there's any, us. like, opportunities. Careful. Enemy. And by the way, this is Dark Zero, I think. It's similar to the winner's bracket, but we have one problem. This zone isn't the exact same. As they mentioned, the back buildings are in and can put pressure on them. But the moment of truth comes. Time to move. Zone is closing, the evac tower has been dropped, and they take to the skies. As they predicted earlier, the teams on the backside are in fact pressuring them and forces them to drop onto the lower balcony. While they sit here, there is a brief moment where they debate on pushing Dark Zero on the high ground as they believe that there are two teams there and DZ might fight so they could third. Focus here, focus here. It's two teams here. Yeah, it's two teams are focused. Yep. They might want to go up there. No, 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 I don't think we do. We're chilling once this ring closes. Okay. We can go. We can go back on how you this ring closes, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah as yeah. soon as it starts closing, we can. But KCP had actually left high ground as DZ crossed. No fight occurs, meaning no third party opportunity ever presented itself. So OXG stays put. Zone starts to close, and oxygen reclaims height. If they can survive until the ring closes, they will have the ultimate height and be in a strong position for endgame. But there's only one problem. Is there anyone on roof? Do we know? Multi roof? I have no yes. idea. How many frags do we have? How many frags do we have? Three frags. Four. Three frags. I have, I have two okay, frags listen, and one arm. Two arm. I think we just throw fucking borders up here when we need to, and then we just ape it if we get big damage. I'll throw one bird. Alright. Anger? I cracked 100 on all of them. Is there another one? I think they put it down now. There's a banger. I got him. Alright, I'll throw one. One hundred thieves launches a bunch of nades onto height, and one of those nades pushes Aiden off the height onto the low ground right in front of Optic. And based on Optic's comms, they didn't even know the oxygen was up there when this initially happens. But they secure the kill onto Aiden, and they now realize that OXG is above them and start to pressure them. Meanwhile, the nades are still flying in, and Vaxalon takes down Reeds. This leaves Vayne left as a solo. Now note, if Vayne dies here, then they will finish this match in fifth place on the overall standings behind FaZe and Xset. A fifth place finish would have gotten them $40,000 less in prize pool earnings than what they do end up getting for third, but they only get that 40 k because of Vayne's solo plays. He drops to the low ground and buys time with his Bangalore smokes. FC Destroy tries to push him, but he stacks nades on their walk up to prevent it and actually aids in killing their squad. 
He grabs an armor swap, goes through a catalyst wall, and stumbles onto an evac tower. He takes it, flies through the air. At this point, he has now secured enough points to pass FaZe Clan and X set. Simply buying this extra time and grabbing one kill secures OXG $40,000. He lands on the ground and takes NRG's horizon lift. Squads are dying all around him. He goes for the tree and he misses it. He falls to the low ground and dies and forth. And of course, Dark Zero takes the win. But was that tree playable? I don't know, but I was definitely going for it. Yeah, it's not. We found out afterwards it's not, but it was it was a good shot. So the tree isn't playable, but if it was, then we might have seen the most legendary land win of all time. When going for the tree, nobody was focusing him. By the time he would have had to drop from the tree, it was down to Optic and Dark Zero in a 1v1. Bangalore smoke covered the floor. The two teams below were focusing each other, and Vayne very may well have dropped onto those two other solos and pulled off the victory. He wasn't able to do it, but they just finished third on the land stage. Considering their journey to this moment, the split one failure to qualify for land, Sentinels and Dark Zero trying to poach Aiden, behind the scenes changes with orgs, notable names questioning and notable orgs denying Psycho, the sacrifices that Psycho had to make in order to even get to this point, even all the doubters of Thornton Smash's ability to be an effective manager, all of that was now irrelevant as they had proven themselves on the biggest stage. The top three teams in the world were the two dynasties and Oxygen Esports. I mean, it's incredibly surreal. Uh, I remember being at North Carolina Champs and a, a person who liked my YouTube content came up to me and asked, hey, are we ever going to see, you know, you guys have a team up here or you have a team that competes? And I said, I don't know, maybe. And then to one year later, pretty much exactly from the date, have a team finish top three at LAN is just surreal. Um, and doing it in an unconventional way and with what, in my opinion, people had discounted. All these discounted pieces made one really super good piece. Um, so it felt incredibly vindicating to know that the, the idea that me and Psycho had started out with was able to develop into this. I felt just this sense of a lot of things are about to change you know i i struggled a lot you know trying to get to this point you know almost giving up and retiring so many times just because of the fiscal burden that it takes to pursue this um you know i remember the conversations you know that i had with my parents i remember the conversations that you know i had with my peers about just not just wanting to give up so much so many times so now you know after all the stuff that i've done I no longer have any imposter syndrome. I don't doubt myself whatsoever. I knew all the things that we did and the things that we could do better and the things that we did right. I am a good coach. I'm arguably one of the best coaches in the scene and in the world. I don't know. It was just nice to like prove like our potential that we knew we had and to kind of showcase like all of our prep, you know, that went into it, um, you know, for it to pay off is a really good feeling. This was kind of like the second time that I felt like, you know, I had accomplished something really huge. Um, and, and to be the one calling, you know, an IGLing definitely makes that even better, which don't get me wrong. Like literally everything is impossible without my team, <laughs> especially staff, like, but to come from, from winning champs and like, as much as I felt really, really good about champs at the moment, you know, kind of afterwards, it kind of felt sour. It didn't feel like that was like a, you know, with beyond, beyond a doubt, like that was something that we necessarily or I necessarily like deserve or like put in enough work for or like you know I think I convinced myself that the stars had kind of aligned for that event but this one was quite the opposite for me so yeah I mean it's the culmination of you know 11,000 hours four years of you know pursuing this game and you know that's been a goal of mine for you know the last 10 years like playing out of land you know, doing well and and just being in that environment, it it feels really good. Um, yeah, it just it felt like I felt like I was supposed to be up there. You know, felt like I, I I belonged on the stage. For Oxygen to win at Champs, they'll need to do so in spite of the two dynasties. So if you want to see how Dark Zero and TSM won the last two lands, click right over here.